Thank you, Lisa. It's been said that hope is one of the greatest means by which someone perseveres through life. See, whether it's war or famine, marriage or career, so long as hope remains, often people are willing to keep going. But how can you be sure that the hope becomes a reality? How can you know the difference between wishful thinking and assured certain hope? See, in our text here, we see the difference, don't we, between those with true certain hope and those with no hope at all when our time on earth is up. We've had a good little bit of time, haven't we, in 1 Thessalonians uh, this week. We've journeyed through these last uh, three chapters. We've seen all that God did through Paul, Silas and Timothy on their missionary journey. We then saw how the Thessalonian people responded to the gospel. How God transformed their lives to turn from idols, to serve him. And the gospel message rang out from them. And now we hit chapters 4 and 5 and Paul is essentially writing to encourage them, to exhort them, to keep going till the end. It's, fa- it's packed full of instruction off the back of Timothy's report to them. We haven't got time to touch upon it all. I really want to encourage you to finish off the whole book, read the whole of 4 and 5 now, this weekend if you can do. But we're going to zero in then on this passage we got before us because Paul is desperate to remind them and teach them about the return of Christ and all that comes with it. It's a major theme of the whole letter. It actually appears in every single chapter. And here we get a lot of detail. See, for Paul, we learnt last night, didn't we? This eternal perspective drove what he did. It was so central to his ministry. But he also wanted people to know about it, to learn about it, to understand what will come. And that's why he says, look, verse 13, he didn't want people to be ignorant or uninformed about what happens to people when they die so that they grieve with no hope. He wants people to know what to expect and he also wants them then to live in light of it. And so it really should be important to you and I. As followers of Christ, as part of God's family, as part of his church, we really should care. We should not be ignorant or uninformed about the return of Christ. So quick self-examination. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most, how much does Christ return affect your day-to-day Christian life? Another way of looking at it, how much does heaven feature in your faith and thinking as you, leave each, as you live each day on earth? See, if what the Bible teaches about the return of Christ and life after death is true, which I assume you believe it is, if what Paul teaches us here in this letter is true, then you've got to sit up and listen. You've really got to hold on to the promises that the Bible teaches and you've got to allow it to affect your day-to-day life. And it's got to certainly affect your evangelism, hasn't it? So here we go. We're going to have a look at it. We're going to look what he says to them and then we're going to think about the implications for ourselves. End of chapter four here. Essentially, what is he talking about? He's talking about what happens to people when they die. And particularly on this case, firstly, Christians. He's reassuring the church at this point as to what exactly happens to their Christian friends and family when they die. And see what he says? In short, they don't miss out. Verse 14, God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. In fact, in verse 15, look, he says, uh, you won't go first. No, the dead will rise. They will precede you and then you will join them in glory. What comfort this would have brought for them. No doubt they were wondering what happened, maybe upset, worried, missing their loved ones. What comfort and peace this would have brought them. And maybe you, maybe you have lost a Christian family member or friend recently. Draw near to what these words are telling you right now. There is comfort in knowing that they will not miss out, they will go to heaven 
And look what happens there. Verse 16, Christ will return. Fact, reality. Jesus is coming. Look at it. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. Jesus is coming back, folks. And on that day, there's going to be a resurrection. Look at the end of verse 16. The dead will, in Christ, will rise first. And then finally, verse 17, there's going to be an incredible reunion between believers and between Jesus and all of his followers. After that, verse 17, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord for Ever. Death is not the end for you, Christian. Praise the Lord, hey? There's more to life than this. There is hope here to have. You need not grieve with no hope because Jesus is coming. Real, genuine, certain hope for you to hold on to. And you're going to meet your fellow Christians you're going to see your fellow Christian family members and friends who maybe go before you. And more than that, you're going to meet Jesus. You're going to see him. Oh, what hope to hold on to. Now, Paul isn't disregarding here the pain, the sorrow, the hurt that comes with losing people. He's not just wiping that away. We see it in many of his letters, how much it hurt him to know of people dying to be separated from other Christians. He, he's not disregarding that. But can't you see here that if you're a follower of Christ, how you ultimately deal with death and the death of another believer is starkly different to those without an answer to it. And that's what he's trying to say to them. It's so different. There's absolute hope available for you. We've seen, haven't we? probably more recently than ever, how much death just rocks our world. I turned my BBC News app on on Tuesday the 20th of December, maybe you did the same, and nine out of the 10 articles was about someone who died or a group of people who had died. It rocks our world. People don't know how to deal with it. We're crippled by it. You remember the Shoreham motorway air crash? Horrific. Someone put a bunch of flowers down and said this on a little note. So unfair, so sudden, so sad. See, one of the greatest lies of our world is that we're unstoppable and we're invincible. Yet death strikes one blow and the whole thing falls apart. People don't know how to deal with death. And it's going to come to everyone. Yet, look what Paul is saying here to the believers. He says, Thessalonians, Christian believers. In fact, he says, Christians in sport, you can have certain hope. You need not despair or grieve. Christ is coming. He will return. You're going to see him, and you're going to live with him forever. Incredible hope here. See how radically different the Christian approaches the finish line of life. I heard a story recently of a Welsh couple out in West Wales, grew up um, going to um, like an old Welsh chapel, um, purely out of tradition, really. Um, but they had a son, and as he was growing up, he decided to go to a different youth group at a different church. Um, and he enjoyed it, and he went regularly. And actually, his mum tells a story that he would come back and she would be getting his clothes to put in the washing machine. And as she, she was kind of turning out the pockets, picking up little pieces of paper with Bible verses on, thinking, what's this all about? He would go to church on a Sunday night in his jeans and his T-shirt, and they would be horrified because he wasn't in a suit. And yet, a few years on, he contracted leukemia. It was aggressive. It all happened fast. And he deteriorated. And they tell the story that they were lying, he was lying there in hospital, they were standing by, it, by his deathbed. And he looked at them in the eye and said, Mum, Dad, don't worry about me. I know where I'm going. I just want you to come with me as well. See, what gives a young lad like that such assurance and hope? What gives Paul 
such assurance and hope to be able to approach death in this way? Well, it's rooted in verse 14 here. Look at it. For we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. See, the basis of Paul's confidence, the root of Christianity's hope, is completely and utterly built upon the truth of Jesus' death and resurrection. This is what it's all about. Because he took your place, because he bore your sins, because he satisfied God's wrath, right here, right now, you're forgiven and redeemed. And because he smashed death to pieces, he rose victorious, and he sits, is sat on high right now, you can know that death is not the end, and there is life beyond the grave. See, the tomb, it really could not hold the living, breathing, scarred but victorious body of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's alive. And Paul says, because he's alive, you too will live. See the logic? If he died and rose again, so will you if you trust in him. Jesus is our risen saviour. Spurgeon says this, Borrow the telescope of faith now. Wipe away the misty breath of your doubts from the glass, will you? And look through it. And behold the coming glory of Jesus. He's alive. And that's what gives you the certainty of hope of a future with him in glory. But there's another reality here. Look at verse 13 again. People are currently living. Your friends in your sports clubs are currently living with no hope, no answers to life's big questions, no solutions to their greatest problems, and certainly no hope of heaven or certainty of heaven. And now we hit chapter 5, C, because Paul goes on to explain what will happen on the day of Christ's return, and then how to live for that day. Timothy must have reported to them that uh, to Paul that they're asking all these questions like, hey, Timothy, when is Jesus going to come back? What's he going to be like? What day? What time? What will he be wearing? Maybe something like that. They wanted to know what it was going to be like. And now we hit verses one to three here. And basically, Paul turns around to them and says, we don't really know. We don't know when he's going to come back. In fact, John chapter 14, Jesus doesn't know when he was going to come back. He says, only the father knows when I'm going to come back. But look what Paul says in these verses, two things. One is, he'll come when people are least expecting it. And two, there's no escape in it. Look at verse two and three. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly. As labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. See, a thief picks their moment, doesn't he? Don't they? When the person's not in, or certainly when they're least expecting it, the thief strikes. So too will be the day of the Lord. And not only will people not see it coming, they'll, they won't be able to escape it. Like labor pains coming on a pregnant woman, once they come, there's no stopping it. Uh, my wife and I had the privilege of having a little boy, Two months ago, Finley Gui on Hampton. There he is. He's turning into a right front row forward <laughs> at the moment, anyway. Um, he was 10 days late, the rascal. Um, and it was a bit of a journey waiting for him to arrive. Now, I reckon if you asked my wife, um, would you have liked a little bit more knowledge as to when exactly he was coming? And um, she'd probably say, yes, please. If you could have told me exactly when he was coming, that would have made life a lot easier. And I reckon if you asked her, um, if I offered you the pause button during it, would you, would you have liked that? And she would probably snap your hand off. The reality was she snapped my hand off. Because hmm. the thing is, when it gets going, unfortunately, girls, sorry to say this, you don't know when it's happening. And when it gets going, there's no stopping it, really. See, that's what it's like. Once the labor pains kick in, eventually you're going to get there. And it's great at the end, I promise you. But this is, what, this is what he's saying here, isn't it? Go back to the text. 
Paul is saying that the day of the Lord, it will come. And you don't know when it's going to come, and you can't escape it. And a day will come where every single human being will stand before the God of the universe and will be held accountable for the way in which they live their life. And if they have rejected God and abused his creation, then destruction awaits them. We've learned about it, hey? God's fair, he's holy, and he's just. And therefore, he will punish sin. See, we owe it to our friends, do we not? To make them aware of this day. There's a hypothetical story of the devil with um, three devil apprentices. Um, and this conversation comes up where the um, apprentices turn and they say, hey, devil, we're going to go out and ruin people in terms of their kind of desire to trust in Jesus for their salvation. And the devil's intrigued and says, well, how do you intend on doing that then? And the first little devil apprentice says, well, I'm going to go out and tell people that there's no heaven. And the devil goes, no, I won't work really, to be honest with you. See, people have got this kind of deep desire that there is more to life than this. And I think a lot of people think they're going to heaven, so that won't work. Second little apprentice goes to the devil and says, hey, uh, I'm going to say there's no hell. Uh, and the devil goes, now that won't work either because people like justice and they hate wrong and they like the idea that some people are going to be punished. I don't think that will work. A third little devil apprentice turns to him and says, no, I've got it. I'm just going to go out and tell people there's no hurry. And the devil looks, smiles and says, yeah, go out and you'll ruin them by the millions. See, there is a hurry, isn't there? Christ is coming back. People need to know about Jesus. They currently live in darkness, it tells us in chapter 5 here. They desperately need to know about the hope found in Christ alone in order to escape this destruction and find peace in Christ. So let me challenge you with this question. If you knew Jesus was coming back in two days' time, what would you do about it? Because he might. We don't know when he's coming. It could happen any point. If he came in two days' time, what would you do? See, there's an urgency here, isn't there? And we don't want people to miss out on this. And now he goes on in verses 4 to 8 to show the difference between those in Christ and those who are not. And he uses light and darkness day and night to show that comparison. Reach out, uh, verses 4 to 8 with me. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep. Let us be awake and sober, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. There's those in darkness, he says, they're asleep, they don't know Christ, they're spiritually detached from God, living debaucherous lives in the night. And yet he says to you right now, and he says to the church in Thessalonica, you are not in darkness anymore. Because of Christ, you are children of light and children of day. And therefore he goes and says, live in light of this. Be different. Be ready. So live. Verse 6, awake, sober. Don't follow people into the darkness. Be ready. And then he says to put on faith, love, and hope. See it again? We saw it in chapter one, didn't we? Like a soldier puts a breastplate on every time he goes into the battle, we must put on the breastplate of love and faith every single time. And like a soldier puts a helmet on that surrounds his head, we've got to put on the helmet of hope in the salvation of Christ. We will not see God's wrath. Verse nine. Salvation awaits you through Christ. Here's the joy of it all. That eternity means Christ forever. The heart of eternity is the reunion with your Savior. You've got to cherish verse 10, haven't you? 
and actually chapter 4, verse 17. You will be with the Lord forever. If you're an underliner in your Bible, uh, this is the moment, hey? You will be in eternity with Jesus, your Savior, forever. No more doubts. No more wondering, question, concerns. You're going to see him. You're going to touch him. You're going to chat with him. You might even chuck a rugby ball around with him. See, no more worries, no more fears, no more failings, no more frailties. You're going to be with the king of the universe who died, smashed death to pieces, and he'll restore you fully in the way that you were meant to live. See, this is a knowledge to have about the future now, isn't it? This is such a comfort to hold on to when there are believers dying around you. And now we've got a hope here for you and for anyone if they choose to trust in Christ, which should drive you every single day to live until that final day. As we close, here's the challenge, hey? Will you join with Paul? Will you join with the church in Thessalonica to make it your life's mission to bring as many people with you into heaven as possible? Will you? Because here's the opportunity. You've got the answer. You've got the solution. You've got the certainty of Christ. On the 4th of July, back in 1854, there was this well-known criminal, Charles Peace, Charlie Peace, they all called him. He was hanged in the middle of London. As he's being marched to the gallows, there's a priest walking behind him, reading out this liturgy. It said, he said, those who die without Christ experience hell, which is the pain of forever dying without the release which death itself can bring. As he's reading it out, Charlie stopped, turned to the priest and said, do you believe that? Do you honestly believe what you just read out to me? The priest is all flustered, doesn't quite know what to say, turns and says, uh, yeah, I suppose, I, I believe so. The criminal turned to him and says, well, I don't. But if I did, I'd get down on my hands, on knee, hands and knees, I would crawl over the whole of Britain, even if it was covered in broken glass, just so I could save and rescue one person. See, death is not the end. Your friends in your sports clubs need not to live in darkness anymore. We have a hope, which is so beyond just wishful thinking. We have an assured, certain hope in Christ, secured for you purely through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And he's going to return. And when he returns, he's going to sweep you up and you're going to be reunited with him forever. So between now and then, then, hey, with the help of God, whatever comes your way, will you dare to tell the good news of Jesus to the world of sport? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that the whole of Christianity and the whole of the hope of heaven is based purely on your son, Jesus, and not on us. Thank you that he died for us in our place. He rose victoriously, showing us he is the king of the world, that death is not the end. And now we have hope of enjoying you forever. Would we put on faith, love, and hope daily to live for you until that day? But would we be brave bold, courageous, to hold out this hope to others around us so they too will stand with us on that day and enjoy you forever. Pray this all in your name. Amen.